this talk is about uh, some really classical problems about Dirichlet series and let's see if this works. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go fishing for trying to catch some little fish in, in a stream or a lake. And uh, this means even if I catch one or two little fishes, uh, there will be more fishes to, to find in the future. So let's look at first results. So uh, the topic r relates to Dirichlet series with a functional <coughs> equation, but to study them, I will have to show some results for a more general Dirichlet series. So the functional equation for Dirichlet series is very interesting. Uh, if you have two Dirichlet series, this is the theorem of Hamburger in 1921. He proved if you have two Dirichlet series, f of s, g of s, let's say a1 is one normalized, they are series that should be convergent for large uh, real part of s, usually denoted by sigma. And uh, f is meromorphic of finite order, finitely many poles. And if there is a functional equation with, which is the functional equation for the, <coughs> uh, the same as the zeta function, then f is equal g is the zeta function. So uh, this theorem was at the time extremely interesting because it shows that the functional equation essentially is a very peculiar characteristic of the zeta function. Well, uh, let's see what's next. However, the uniqueness does not hold in general. If you take a positive definite quadratic form, you look at the corresponding Epstein zeta function for the quadratic form. Then it satisfies a well-known functional equation with uh, now here the discriminant appears and the gamma factor. And this is well understood now uh, why is gamma s and not gamma s over 2 uh, because uh, the quadratic form is associated to a quadratic field, a complex quadratic field, and that's its reason for gamma s. And so you can have lots of function, uh, same, you see the functional equation depends only on the discriminant. And so uh, of course, if you change quadratic form in an equivalence class, the um, epsilon zeta function does not change. And so there are as many, uh, the search series form a vector space. Uh, uh, well, if now they are normalized, but uh, if you don't norm normalize the thing, you get a vector space of dimension equal to the class number of the quadratic field. Okay. So there's a, a vector space, C vector space of dimension H of D, solutions of the functional equation. Okay. Now, uh, still the question of what the role of the functional equation in the distribution of zeros remained open and still open. Uh, and in 1935, Yes. I know that those are the only solutions uh, to, the, to that particular functional equation, the ones which are Well, uh, there are results of that sort, but uh, it's, um, <coughs> uh, I, I know in some cases it's been shown, but I, I'm not sure exactly. It's very likely that they are the only ones. Uh, there are works, um, uh, uh, more recent uh, study, so-called functions in the Selber class. And this will be uh, oh, what we call weight rank of uh, z functions, say rank one, and this will be rank two. 
And only recently, the, the, this type of uniqueness results have been extended to rank two, if I understand things correctly. So uh, this works of Kaczorowski and Perelli. Uh, so I believe that uh, equations of this type uh, they essentially are associated to automorphic forms of, of and uh, <coughs> uh, this is so the class for which the functional equation is true is or it's fine. Uh, you may also consider presence of characters also. So it's uh, but essentially they all arise from automorphic situation. Uh, if you have the functional equation with beyond gamma s, say think of a functional equation you get for a dedicated into the functional cubic field, uh, we'll have a say for a, um, gamma s over, over two times gamma s and so on. Um, then uh, the question of uniqueness I think is, is wide open. Okay. Well, in 1930, in the 30s, people did not know. They didn't even know how to compute these zeros. So uh, the result of Hamburger was the first question whether the functional equation was responsible for a Riemann hypothesis. So in the first result, as far as I know, that shows that the Riemann hypothesis does not hold because of the functional equation uh, was done in 1935, and they, in their paper they, they proved that there are infinitely many zeros on the critical line and a certain rate up to high t, order of t. I uh, will talk about that. And, uh, but then they mentioned that the numerical calculation shown in this case uh, the m squared plus 5n squared, the first case of class number two, in fact, um, there's a zero off the line, and this is the first one. You can co now you can compute that in a few seconds, a fraction of a second on the, on the computer at the time was a fairly complicated task. There were no computers that could do things by hand. So it's now, here is the next, uh, they stated that the first six zeros are on the critical line, the next is not. But you see, you always have to check uh, papers. And it turns out the first seven zeros are on the critical line, and this is the eighth. <laughs> so, I'll uh, go and come to that. All right. So, Perhaps motivated by the paper by uh, Potter and Titchmarsh, Darren Perry Halbrun in 1936 studied the phenomenon what happens to the zeta function if you make the translation, the so called Hurwitz zeta function. And they s proved that such a function usually has plenty of zeros with real part greater than one, in fact. So the idea was that by Bohr almost periodicity, the set of value in a strip uh, to the right of one in a <coughs> coincides with the set of values uh, of some a n n plus a to the s, provided a n absolute value is one, and the coefficients a n satisfy the same multiple relation as the number n plus a because then you can arrange n plus a to the i t, the, to the imaginary part, uh, because of the multiple relations are the same, uh, to, to, to mimic precisely the a n's. Since you are in the region of absolute convergence, you can go to the limit, and then you get the actual value as zeta s a coincides the, this thing when <coughs> like this. In fact, you can, in this case, you may assume that when you vary a n, then your s can be just real. Vary, vary a n with absolute value one, 
provided condition two is satisfied. Now, how do you satisfy condition two? Uh, well, first I have to say what, what you prove. So, so if A is transcendental, the numbers n plus A is are multiply independent, so there's no restriction on the coefficient A n, period. By choosing n equal one for the initial stretch and minus one for the rest, and noticing that the series sum a n n minus s goes to then for s real uh, going to one goes to minus infinity, it diverges to minus infinity for s equal one, and but for s plus infinity is equal to one, it's real, so s is zero. Okay, somewhere in between. Therefore, the function has an infinite of zero to real part arbitrarily close to, to this number. Okay, next. Now, if A is rational, uh, this is more delicate, and they treated it by expressing the, <coughs> the um, <coughs> well, you write A L over K, multiply K minus S, then you have an honest Dirichlet series over a progression. You analyze the progression with characters, Dirichlet characters mod K. So you get, <coughs> uh, you end up by studying linear combination of function LSK, K. And you, now you notice that the same story, that the values of, oops, this, this one, yeah, of this uh, function here, uh, they are the same as the value of the L function. So you choose A for a prime equal to one, A P one, if the quadratic character is one or zero, and, and I, if the quadratic character is minus one, then what happens is uh, the, you can replace the linear combination of which uh, describes the Hurwitz zeta function by the one in which you have substituted the quadratic character in, in that way. And <coughs> okay, then you, you look at this combination and you discover that the function what we call MS chi with this choice of the ANs as uh, uh, a funny singularity at s equal one, with not not a pole. It's uh, essential singularity, and uh, <coughs> by looking at uh, pro appropriate asymptotics, this shows there are <coughs> infinitely many zeros which accumulates at one. So in this case, you get a combination uh, of. Um, which is zero again. Notice that you need at least two characters. Uh, so this thing, uh, of course, does not work. You need a quadratic character for, for doing this game. So the next uh, is, um, if you have an Epstein zeta function, if you have a real non-trivial character in the cl class group, you apply the same argument. This is in in Davenport Halbron's paper, 1936. Now, uh, this is, but to have a quadratic character, a real character must be quadratic, so the class number must be even. The class number is odd. Uh, the argument does not quite work as directly in a such a simple way. What, and they wrote a second paper showing how to deal with that case. Uh, the choice of the coefficient AP was done in a recursive fashion and it's much more complicated, but the result is the same. So the Hurwitz zeta function, except for the exceptional values, obvious exceptional values of the translation A, um, has infinitely many zeros in the half plane sigma greater than one by almost periodicity, if you have a strip which contains a zero, 
then up to high t, you get order of t zero. So in fact, you get even an asymptotics for that. What happens if the translation algebraic, uh, neither method works, and really you have to analyze the uh, structure of multiple relations for the n plus a. And that, by the way, seems to be a very tricky problem. What are the multiple relations between the numbers n plus square root of 2 when n runs over the integers? Uh, I think nobody knows. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's an open problem to understand the structure of these multiple relations. It, I think it's an interesting uh, problem, not in itself, it's the prototype of a certain class of problems, which I think is uh, interesting. So, next. Um, so, for algebraic number, it was sold by Castles in a paper we titled Footnote to a Note of Dunford and Helbron. Uh, it's a pretty hard paper, actually, and uh, it's a very uh, clever argument is um, non stupid, non trivial algebraic number theory to, to go to the end. Basically, you have to prove that if there are multiple relations, there are very few. Uh, now, can you prove the same for the Eisenstein series, uh, say Epstein zeta function of positive definite quadratic form? Uh, not, not a rational quadratic form anymore. So uh, just any point C in the upper half plane. Uh, the case with C transcendental is treated exactly the same way. You don't have uh, <coughs> uh, algebraic relations. And, uh, it, but uh, Castle's argument does not extend. It, it seems the, the, the there are some statements in the literature that it extends, but I, I really uh, don't know. I have to say, I, one of the guys uh, wrote <laughs> that it extends, but then uh, trying to look carefully, I decided <laughs> the argument does not extend. And Stark, uh, Harold Stark, thinks the same. So I had to correct myself in, in, in the pa published paper, I correct myself. OK. So distribution of zeros. Uh, the number of zeros up to high t was by Harding little so showed is at least constant times t uh, on the critical, zeros on the critical line. Uh, zero gave a completely different proof of the same result in, I think, 1929. So Selber introduced in 42. Modifi modifiers, so multiplied zeta by some approximate inverse to uh, have to do it in a very clever way, actually. Uh, the stupid modifier does not work, so you have to be very careful. And it was able to show that a positive percentage of zeros to the Riemann zeta function indeed lie on the critical line. Uh, Siegel Siegel's method is very different from, from Hardy and Littlewood. Uh, Selber may be considered uh, as a very basic refinement of the initial idea of Hardy and Littlewood. And in 74, Levinson gave, again, a very deep refinement of Siegel's uh, method. He also uses modifiers, but in a completely different way, completely different modifiers. And and this proof is, from a quantitative point of view, gives better results. Uh, the, now the percentage of zeros on the critical line is, is more than 40%. Um, yes, something? Yes. Uh, I, I think um, Selber's method gives only odd multiplicity, but not quite simple zeros. Uh, so it's a different, uh, really different method. However, Selber's method extends uh, not so automatically, but also with some extra work, non-trivial extra work, 
uh, to study uh, L functions in GL2, for example. And as far as I know, Levinson's method has not been extended. It seems to be very hard to extend it to, to GL2. Um, Selber method, I mean, once you start and you discover that you, the modifier is good enough, you know you're going to get the result. In Levinson's method, uh, you don't know you get the positive percentage until you have computed certain numbers. Uh, only if a number, which you <laughs> it's complicated, given by some function with exponentials and so on, and depending on a parameter, if that gets bigger than another complicated number, then you know that the difference is your percentage. But the a priori, there is no reason, uh, as far as I know, to say that it has to become bigger. So it's a kind of the story. Obviously, it's not finished. Mm. So for linear combinations of two L functions with the same functional equation, so think of the, <coughs> uh, we go back to the functional equation. And then uh, Voronin used Selberg's first method to, the, the, to about history, uh, the first paper by Selberg proved only that t times triple log t zeros on the critical line. Because this modifier was just a product, uh, was a truncation of the Euler product. So it had to be very short, otherwise you get too many terms. <coughs> and this uh, method was uh, used by Voronin, and it got exponential square root of quadruple log, so not quite a triple log altogether. Uh, that was improved by Karatsuba in 1989 to exponent half. Uh, to be precise, uh, that was done uh, at a conference in Maiori. I was present at that conference. In, and this result uh, originally was 1 over 20 or 1 over 12, I think. And uh, then uh, everybody, Dennis Hetchel and Salberg and myself, we pointed out that the, that the method used could give easily the exponent in half, and then that was finished at the blackboard. And, but I mean, the idea was Karatsuba. But the one half was obtained through a discussion after a lecture. And, but then, <laughs> what is the correct uh, bound? In 1998, so Sal was already more than emeritus, I suppose, <laughs> proved that a positive percentage t log t zeros for a general combination of Dirichlet L functions emitting a functional equation standard type. Uh, this paper, however, is not written yet. Uh, there are some notes by Selberg, and uh, I know Dennis Hedgel is working on that to put in a publishable form. And eventually, I, I do hope that it will be. Um, it's not. A, it's not a straightforward uh, application of Selberg's method. And I talked to Selberg about that, and, and he explained to me that, in fact, his method does not prove that. He had to use his first method to prove that, which was more complicated. Then he got a simpler method, which it, that is published paper of 1942. And uh, this one. He went back to his drawer, <laughs> and that was his first idea, how to study the problem, and that seems to work. Anyway, um, he gave a lecture here, a lecture at a meeting in AMS in New York. Uh, I think a lecture in um, MSRI. And there are the notes of the lectures are available, I think, at MSRI. And there are the, this manuscript notes and you ask what C is, well, uh, if you have a combination of, of n such functions, of course, all these with the same functional equation, uh, then C is order absolute constant divided by n. And uh, for GL2, it uh, looks like 
uh, there are some difficulties, but it looks like the same result can be proved. And C will be about uh, absolute constant divided by n squared. So lower. lower bound. Yeah. Now, with certain additional hypotheses, then almost all zeros should be on the line. So maybe the suggestion is that, I don't know whether it's true, but I, I begin to believe that this is probably correct, that the functional equation alone is responsible to, for having almost all zeros on the critical line, but not all. And you expect a lot of exceptions as a failure in detected by Pot and Titchmarsh, there will be, in fact, lots of exceptions. Okay. I've not said what the natural hypotheses are, but essentially you have to assume a Riemann hypothesis for each uh, L function in the linear combinations. Um, and uh, you assume some weak uh, form of pair correlation conjecture and other things like that. Okay, better move. Okay, so now let's move to a little slightly different topic. Suppose I have a different series convergent in a half plane and look at the reciprocal series, one over F. So Lando proved in 1933 that if F is not zero for real part of S greater than alpha, then the degree series for a 1 over F converges in the same half plane, and the coefficient Bn is of at the most of order n to the alpha plus little o 1. Okay. Uh, I've been told, I've not seen the paper, that if F, the series for F is not only convergent, but absolutely convergent, for real part of S greater than alpha, then the series for the reciprocal is absolutely convergent for real part of S greater than alpha. I've been told this is a theorem due to Gelfand in the 30s. Uh, I've not found a reference yet. Gelfand. 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 What? Yeah, yeah, but for the. Gelfand. Fond. Fond. A O Gelfond. No, the other thing is Gelfond. Yeah, but that's what I was thinking. Was that, is that what you're thinking? Then some Tiberius. No, no, no. It's Gelfond of the of the Hilbert yeah. uh, problem, seventh problem. Alpha so to the beta, uh, the transcendental. If alpha you and beta, I've not seen the, the proof. I don't have a reference yet. This was I was told that, that there is such a theorem, but I have to look at anyway. No, this is, the proof of lambda is quite, is elementary, but quite subtle. Uh, that, that's, uh, I mean, you think of the theorem that one over F, uh, 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 Gelfand of the series is, is uh, the Fourier series converges and therefore vanishes one over F. Also has absolute. It's in that, that flavor, but. But that's Gelfand. No, 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 this is a different, <laughs> the <end> font. <laughs> okay, maybe I should yeah. write it down. So, so. Moretti, so Moretti went to work with Gail Fond, but ended up working with Gail Fond by mistake. <laughs> okay. So let's, so this is the theorem of Lando. Now, um, you will notice that F, is the zeta function. Okay, so a n is one. It's convergent for real part greater than one. But now the reciprocal b n is one, so the upper bound is not so exciting. <laughs> yeah? So let's see. Oops. How do you oh here. Okay. So if you have a zero beta with real part greater than alpha, and beta, uh, zero rho, uh, so let's say beta is the supremum of the real part of zeros of f in the region of 
convergence. Then this series for 1 over f has a position of convergence equal to beta. And therefore, we have a lower bound, n to the beta minus 1. Otherwise, this series will be obviously convergent up to including beta, in fact, even a little more to the right, which is cannot be because it's a pole. So you have a lower bound for, in presence of zero, you have a lower bound. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's go back. Take now f to be 1 over zeta, because this conveniently is a zero at s equal 1. So the lower bound, if you apply this, on the real hypothesis, I know that f is convergent for real part greater than a half. That was, in fact, uh, shown by Stiltjes to be equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis back in 1884, 8, something like that. As an isolated 0 is equal 1, f is not 0, c or greater, so beta is 1, bn is 1, so the lower bound is sharp, assuming the Riemann hypothesis. By the way, this is a conditional example, and uh, uh, it, perhaps one can modify it somehow to to get unconditional, but I don't. I've not seen. Uh, there may be some work uh, around which proves that. So I, I've not found a, yet a precise reference to remove the conditional, but quite possibly is. Uh, in the literature. So at least I wouldn't say alpha equal half, but let's say alpha less than one and find a fake Mabius function and you know and show that the lower bound is sharp. So let's give a refinement assuming that now this series is absolutely convergent. Then the upper bound is sharp. If you have, if it's absolutely convergent as as a zero uh, in that half plane, absolute convergence, and uh, beta now is the uh, <coughs> lowest upper bound for the real part of zeros, uh, then B n there are, there are some B n s which grow like n to the beta. So this is the new theorem. Shows that the reciprocal would have some very large coefficients. But keep in mind, the, the reciprocal converges for sigma greater than, half, than beta. So you cannot have too many large coefficients. So corollary, the Landau's upper bound is optimal in this situation. Uh -huh. I'll give a sketch of proof. The idea is to study not the Dirichlet series, but the restriction of the Dirichlet series to the semigroup generated by primes up to a certain bound. And the point is, uh, by multiplicativity, uh, 1 of f and f have the same support after this restriction. Okay, so, and by absolute convergence, this also absolute convergence, and the convergence uniform in any closed half plane uh, st uh, st strictly to the right of alpha. So, because of that uniform convergence, if I have a zero of f, um, <coughs> Uh, then you find the zero of f of z, z large. There will be, uh, you can find a large z such as f is close zero to rho. Rho is the zero of f in that half plane. And uh, by increasing the parameter z, you can find a zero a little, very close, but not. Um, uh, just uh, 
because of this uniform convergence, they use um, prin the principle of the argument to, to show that uh, in a superficially small, any small disk around that, z is large, you must have a zero. Okay. However, you have a pole at 1 over f as a pole. So the major node series is divergent. Now split the sum into dyadic intervals, compare the sum with 1 over nu square, and then the sum we find the infinitely many dyadic intervals in which the sum is greater than nu to the minus 2 times the <coughs> length to the power delta prime. The point is that the elements of P of z is is fairly small, it's new to the z at the most. So you get a lower bound for Vn, and then you choose <coughs> z appropriately. <coughs> uh, and uh, Vn is large, uh, and uh, so you can see that the growth of these Vns is like delta prime, n to the delta prime, and that gives you your result. So this argument is due to Hille in, uh, in the thirties. Now, here a little mean value theorem. What about the mean value of the coefficients? Uh, so this theorem two, suppose again, uh, just normalize, uh, say a n is n to the epsilon. And suppose f is a zero row with real part greater than one, then one over f, I know it has large coefficients uh, like uh, n to the beta. And what can you say about the sum of the n squared? Well, you can say something if you divide by n, then it's at least x to the two beta minus one, okay. So uh, this, uh, it turns out this lower bound, in fact, is usually, uh, you expect it to be the correct one. Now, how do you prove such a lower bound? Uh, the proof of such a lower bound is, uh, uses a little trick. First of all, the exponent 2 to the beta minus 1 is sharp. It's an example which shows the equalities attained. Beta greater than 1 cannot be replaced by beta greater than equal 1. And but, uh, so how do you prove it? So the proof is to prove a density, what is called a density theorem, except you do it in reverse. You try to prove a density theorem you know that you're going to fail to prove a density theorem because you have a, you have a zero is in the region of absolute convergence and by Bohr almost periodicity up to high t in a, any strip around that zero, you will have at least t zeros up to high t, order of t zeros. So you cannot gain any exponent over t. But you try to do that and see what happens. So you multiply <coughs> the, uh, this thing by use of, by mollifier, except you do it in reverse. So you take, <coughs> you try to prove that there are f as very few zeros, and you fail. Why you fail? Or better, why you can prove a density theorem that the number of zeros of zeta in the critical strip is not uh, away from a half, is a power of t less than one. The reason is, if you look carefully, is that the reciprocal series has very small coefficients, that mu n is bounded by one, and this is the key thing. Now here, you know you're going to fail, that will mean that the method will fail, and that will mean that the reciprocal series must have some la many large coefficients. So that's the way it works. You the mollifier is a truncation of the inverse, the, the most stupid mollifier you can think of. Multiply f by the mollifier gets some coefficients, which are a convolution. And uh, the multiplying, of course, the zeros f remain zeros of the, of the thing. 
The modifier kills all the coefficients between 1 uh, and x, except, of course, n equal 1. And now you, you compute the, <coughs> the what is called the Jensen function. This is the, essentially, you integrate the, the standard formula for, um, it comes from the principle of the argument. This is very standard. And you take the average when t goes to infinity, and that will give you the density of zeros. And use now the inequality, log 1 plus z less than equal z, which is the right thing to do because the m is essentially more or less an inverse of f. So z usually will be small. So the loss is not gigantic. So you have this, <coughs> this thing. Uh, you take the L2 value. That's easy to show, to compute, because the series is absolutely convergent. Uh, and so the mean value exists, the square mean value, the limit. And so the once you do this, uh, you get <coughs> the, uh, just a little calculation, and you end up with using the fact now the density of zeros you know is positive. You get a lower bound for the quantity, uh, for this quantity here. The lower bound is a constant. So this is bounded below by constant, so the integral is greater than constant times t. And, uh, and <coughs> So by comparing things, you get the result uh, at the end, and then it's easy to, to make a summation over m. You get the result. So I think that that's a cute thing to use the, the technique to prove something positive, And you know, you cannot prove that anything. And then you get something positive out of it. So <laughs> Okay, so now. Yeah. Yeah. I proved the uh, so mean value, a mean value that if, if you have a Dirichlet series, the coefficients n to the epsilon, yeah. suppose it has one zero with real part greater than one. Notice this means, uh, in particular, that this is absolutely convergent for a real part greater than 1. Consider this a reciprocal series, then you have this lower bound for, for the it's a weighted mean square value. And the lower bound is sharp in some cases. OK, now let's go to the. Diamond Pro Heilbron function, these are the simplest combinations of L series with, which has a non trivial functional equation. Will be the L functions for the char characters mod 5. So, with two functions uh, will be for the <coughs> uh, complex character. And so, uh, the coefficients will be 1 xi minus xi minus 1 and 0. Mm. And the two values which are written here, phi is the golden ratio, uh, and then you have these functional equations. Uh, by the way, the, if you read Titchmarsh's uh, book on the zeta function, this function occurs in Titchmarsh, at least to the tau plus. Uh, the formulas for tau plus in Tichmors is uh, rather ugly, uh, very com complicated combination of square roots and so on. But it turns out uh, you can express in this form, which I find it much more appealing. So uh, what happens uh, here describes our Uh, well, uh, you missed the beginning of the, of the lecture, so it's. Uh, 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 
I began the lecture with the theory of Hamburger in 1921, which shows that the only Dirichlet series, uh, pair of Dirichlet series satisfying functional equation like the zeta function is the zeta function. So here, uh, then there was a uh, uh, potent Dichmer show that even if you have a functional equation, the in a more general situations, the Riemann hypothesis may, may not be true. And uh, the <coughs> then for Halbron studied some cases, combination of L series, and, and uh, the example before, so it's the simplest example of combination L series, which has a functional equation. Uh, the gamma factor is the same for Dirichlet series for the character uh, uh, modulus five, and uh, <coughs> the complex character mod five, and uh, the for these two values, uh, you get these two functions. If you put an L series instead of having here the plus, or, oh, sorry. First of all, instead of having here the L series here you get the conjugate L series with the conjugate coefficients. And instead of plus minus, you have a f some factor of absolute value one, which is called the root number. Yeah, and, and I'm going to say something about that. Okay. So um, here it tells you how to obtain this, this function. Is this uh, linear combination will give you those coefficients I mentioned before. K chi 1 is complex character. And uh, this is the conjugate character, in fact. And then. Um, the, uh, you can rewrite it this way. And uh, let's look now zeros of the line, since we are talking about that. Uh, up to 10,000, uh, compute 2,479 zeros with a real part greater than 0 0.5. The largest real part is fairly far away, 2.374 and, some, and something. So if I had plotted the zeros on the critical line, okay, which I didn't, here on from 1.5, so just inside here, you will see a line without, without holes. We'll see thousands, thousands of zeros. So um, there are 2,000 zeros off, but on the in, in here, the number of zeros is, is uh, I forgot how many, 6,000, 7,000. You will see just a solid line because uh, the zeros here are just dots with a certain thickness. So uh, here, interesting, there are two interesting things. One, n very near the zeros, the line and a half, there, there, there's not much. I mean, here there will be a solid line, which I'm not mm, putting. But also, very close to that, it's not many. The concentration is, you know, there's a little repelling effect. So like if you um, try to, to get a zero too close to the line, it prefers to fall on the line. And and otherwise, you get quite a few. And then they get less and less. But in the end, when you get far away, uh, you, you see a concentration of zeros. And uh, I will explain. Is the level is the zero the function turned off when you are off the line? Oh, there is uh, there's an upper bound. Well, I'll tell you how to compute how far they can go. Ah, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, there is a density function, but computing it is not, is not trivial. One can prove, 
the existence of a density function has been proved. The number of zeros uh, for this, this one, combination with two L series. Um, in this case, so you take a strip like that, and uh, you ask how many zero up to high t. That's a certain, is the integral of a certain measure between, say, the strip is between, between alpha and beta here. Okay, so the integral between alpha and beta with a certain density, and uh, 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 the density is positive, by the way, and, uh, uh, and that you multiply by t, and that's your frequency. But to write down the density is, is very complicated. And so I, I think he's asking you if you what? mean normalized. Now, most of zero is normalized. Yeah. Lower order, order, order of t. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's yeah. the integral. Uh, asking whether you still have the GUE or something. Oh, that's an interesting question, but uh, it's not been studied yet. So Th that no, is something no, for the future. Like we live through the next graduate student. <laughs> the, the next gra the, uh, good graduate student can do that, I suppose. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good question, but. Uh, the, the distribution of gaps, two-dimensional two distribution of gaps, is not, uh, it's not even entirely clear how to, to study that. But, but did, did you say that there is a, there is a kind of a gap between the axis uh, half or the not, not quite a gap, because um, there will, but the, the um, let's put it this way, the, the gap you expect is, uh, is controlled by double log. Okay. So the double log in these intervals is, is a constant. So you, l you look at kind of constant gap. <laughs> but you but, but really go very high, very 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to 1,000 or so. Then you begin to see this thing getting narrower. But uh, even the, the correct statistics um, for that are still conjectural. So now zero free L, there's a zero free half plane. So the theorem here, if xi is real, the zeros uh, appear will be solutions of this equation. The theta was a parameter I defined before. And the C is purely imaginary, absolute value greater than one, then you have to s solve this equation. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, sketch a proof. Uh, well, maybe. Basically, the idea is the following um, you take. To say linear combination is zero, you have only two functions. So the ratio of the two functions has to be a certain constant. And now the two functions, the two well functions have an Euler product. So we want a certain Euler product to be a constant, not zero, some constant, specific constant. And this is the problem you can study with Bohr's technique because when you take the log of the Euler product, you get a function that depends only on p to the s. But the p's are multiply independent. So when the imaginary part changes, you just can independently are on the infinite torus modulo one. So uh, you're, you're basically the prime numbers disappear from this type of question. So it's, uh, that's uh, only for the, so the closure of the vector p to the it, p uh, any set of primes, infinite or infinite, it does not matter, is the torus t to the p, the power p. Okay. So, <coughs> this is the, specialization of the theorem to not just all primes, but you can do with any s s subset of the primes. Okay, so let's see how do you find 
solve the equation. I want to find the large coefficients. So I look at 1 plus xi, uh, uh, <coughs> p congruent to 2. I look at just the primes generated only one prime. You look at the coefficients for a power of p. Then the series you can as this factorization and uh, and from here you compute the the, the um, uh, the coefficient of the reciprocal rather easily and the 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 sigma, the how far you can go, the, the, the growth is exactly this thing, which is the solution of the equation, which was the the uh, um, the solution of the equation that described how far you can get with the zeros. Now you can do things in a slightly different way, and. <coughs> You notice the coefficients a, p to the h are periodic in h, uh, in this case at mod 4. And the Mabus inversion formula you can write in this form with uh, now instead uh, <coughs> is because uh, p to the j correspond to the divisors of p to the n. So you get uh, your inversion formula. And this gives you a recursion. Because now, since the coefficients are periodic, you can split the equation into pieces by collecting together uh, the same, same coefficient a. So this is what you do. You write x a, and, and so you, instead of doing the uh, x like that, you collect the things for which the, the c's are the same, okay? And then you end up with these equations according to n to the congruence of n modulo 4. So depending on where n is, you get either this one, this one, oops, uh, or that one, this one, or that one. So this, uh, so this is described in terms of a matrix, m multiplying matrices. So let's see how it works. So you have these two matrices, the Mabius inversion formula. Now you can write in this, this way. You consider generating series, then F, uh, you have to compute uh, <coughs> The generating series can be obtained now by this formula here, uh, this one, okay. And I want to see the radius of convergence that is determined by the zeros of the denominators. So I look through the determinant, which is this. So x is to xi to minus 4 or 1. So the minimum of the two is the radius of convergence, and from here you, d you get the maximum growth, and you get the formula I gave before. Good. Now, since we have a little discussion, I think I can have five minutes to go to the next. Two primes by maybe some inversion, you do the same thing. Let's see how it goes. Uh, this time it's a two-dimensional linear recurrence because I prime p and the prime q. So the matrices will be uh, mod 4 in each direction. And so you get 16 by 16 matrices. So it begins to get a little big to do by hand. You have a generating function. And now you compute that determinant. So I, <laughs> I can guarantee you it's correct. <laughs> I didn't make any typos. <laughs> okay, that's the factorization. And now I have to find the zeros. Uh, I have to take this. Uh, I express things by Cauchy integral. 
So real is the uh, what I want to do. I want R1, R2 big so that FZW is not zero. Okay. So I try the bigger to stay away from the origin that give me give, gives me an upper bound and that will be essentially correct. Um, so how you do that? So I have to find the minimum of z minus m w to minus <coughs> m under this condition. So I'll just tell you the analysis you can do it. It takes uh, several pages and that's the result. Very explicit. So consider the, the coefficient uh, located at p to power hq to the k. Uh, the ratio h divide h plus k, call it u. Define these two functions, e plus minus, that way. And t is psi squared, then if absolute psi is greater than one, the growth is given by this function here, this, this one. So as you see, the, the analysis is complicated. I mean, it takes a little while to, to get it. Now, I want to show you what happens if, uh, first, the verification of the formula, because it may be suspicious that some mistake has been made <laughs> when you handle things without knowing what, what, what comes out. Uh, you don't know if in right away. So the equation for sigma for the real part in this case are zeros. Say p equal 2, q equal 3. And if you take tau minus, you get uh, sigma is 2.31490976222 and blah, blah, blah. Uh, if you remember that picture, there was a zero located at 2.314 and something, but a little more to the, um, to the, uh, in that vicinity already. Anyway. Okay. So this is what comes from the direct formula. But I had this formula here. Uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, this one. So what I have to do, I have to compute the maximum of this respect to u. So you compute it. That's the value of u. Uh, the, by the way, computation was done to 50 decimal places and I found it satisfactory enough to say, yeah, is the, the formula is correct. It's computed two different, completely different ways, and one by direct uh, computation uh, using the Bohr periodicity, the other one by using Mabius inversion and the numbers uh, fit. So you want to do the computation, the comparison with the actual values of coefficients. And here you see the plot is uh, um, each one is a coefficient, some h and some k. There's a 10,000 of them. Okay. The f this is the theoretical curve. This is the actual value of the logs. Why there is a little gap, that's clear because the asymptotics is not an exact power, but there will be, first of all, the constant term in, in front, and there may be secondary terms. So uh, that, that's, I find that quite satisfactory. And <coughs> the direct method is uh, like what I did first for one prime and turned out to be a bit simpler. So this time we have a simpler generating function. Uh, calculation is still not very simple, but anyway, you do the same type of thing. Uh, there's this function w0 of z, which plays a role. And I'll tell you what the thing is. OK, alpha is given by this formula. 
where zeta plus minus is this. It's far less complicated than the other one. Uh, well, you may try to prove that they're the same number <laughs> directly. That, that's, uh, 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 I've not tried because it um, there will be very complicated transformations involved. However, I'll show you just to make you happy that first of all, the distribution of zeros for p equal 2, q equal 3. Uh, the picture is because now you have the function is almost periodic. So this is a reflection of almost periodicity. And I think it's quite nice. And there are the zeros of that polynomial. Um, and the first formula for the alpha was gives this picture here. The second formula gives that picture here. And if you're not satisfied, you take the difference of the two functions. And this is what you get. Uh, notice that this is 5 times 10 to the minus 15. And the reason for these little oscillations is because Mathematica, when it does compu computations in floating point, uh, the last digits is change at random. So it will never be, if I do a second time, the, that picture will be a little different. Okay, so it's, uh, so the conclusion, open problems. Uh, yeah, this, I'd like to see the, <coughs> the proof that the Einstein series is yes, as zeros with real part greater than one, unless <coughs> z is equadratic irrational associated to an order with class number one. <coughs> That's, I would like to show that. To show that really, as soon as you have a functional equation, almost all zeros are on the line. That's a tough one. Show that for linear combinations with more than two terms, you have a density function and <coughs> For uh, uh, for all uh, real part of s greater than half. So the study distribution coefficients in for more general situation, particularly when the semigroup p gets bigger and bigger, what happens to that? Oh, that's <laughs> the Thank you.